And there were a rare few occasions when some of them did express some prejudice in this regard. And on one occasion, Abu Dhar ibn al Ghaffari, who the Prophet ﷺ promised would be among the people of paradise. Abu Dhar, in a fit of anger, he called Bilal in a negative sense, you son of a black woman. In a negative sense, he was the son of a black woman. In reality, but he used the terms in a negative sense. When the Prophet ﷺ heard that, he turned to Abu Dhar and said, Anta rajulun fikal jahiliya. You are a man in whom the beliefs of the time of ignorance remains. There is ignorance in you. And he was very angry. These are the times when the Prophet ﷺ was angry. And it was visible in his face. Anger over injustice. So when Abu Dhar realized that, realized the error, because these things happen, comes out of people's mouths without thinking, he immediately put his head on the ground in front of Bilal and said, I will not lift my head until you walk over it. And in those days, one might say, what's the big deal about walking over somebody's head? This was a symbol of humility. You have been humbled so much so that your master, those who are over you, walk over your head. Bilal said, no, no, it's okay. No, it's all right. You know, I know you have made the error and you are repentant. You know, I don't hold you for it. You don't have to do that. Please don't. In fact, Bilal refused to step over his head. Abu Dhar refused. He said, by Allah, I'm not going to lift my head until you step over it. Meaning, if you don't, I'm going to be lying here for God knows how long. So in order to relieve him of that guilt, to help him relieve himself of the guilt, Bilal walks over his head. This happened among the companions of the Prophet. May God's peace and blessing be upon him. In the generations to come, what we find is a variety of examples when we look at the great scholars of Islam. Those who studied under the companions of the Prophet, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, known as the Tabi'un. Many of them were former slaves who were black. Slaves from varying other backgrounds, non-Arabs. And they were narrators of the traditions of the Prophet They were the teachers of Abu Hanifa, the teachers of Imam Malik, the teachers of Ahmed ibn Hanbal and al-Shafi, the great scholars of Islam. They were their teachers. And they were their students. And on down through the generations. And this is how Islam has been. It showed practically that there really is no superiority based on color or race. The leading scholars of hadith, for anyone who studies the science of hadith, which is the second most noble science after the sciences of the Quran for any Muslim to study. The leading narrators, compilers of hadith, were non-Arabs. Ibn Majah, and Nasai, Al-Bukhari, and so on and so forth, were non-Arabs. And this has been the tradition. And we can find in our times, people seeing that and being moved by that to become Muslims. For example, in the statements of Muhammad Ali, Muhammad Ali, formerly known as Cassius Clay, the boxer from America. He said, the pilgrimage to Mecca was an exhilarating experience to see people belonging to different colors, races, and nationalities. Kings, heads of states, and ordinary men from very poor countries, all clad in two simple white sheets, praying to God 
without any sense of either pride or inferiority. It was a practical manifestation of the concept of equality in Islam. And after him, Malcolm X, actually before him, Malcolm X, he had observed the same thing when he went on Hajj. He came back saying, never have I witnessed such sincere hospitality and the overwhelming spirit of true brotherhood as is practiced by people of all colors and races here in this ancient holy land. The home of Abraham, Muhammad, and all of the prophets of the holy scriptures. For the past week, I have been utterly speechless and spellbound by the graciousness I see displayed all around me by people of all colors. And when he returned to America and the press met him and asked him about his opinions, his changes that have taken place, if there were any changes in his views, he said one of the key factors that he said was that I can see that the only solution for racism in America is Islam. The only solution for racism, and you're speaking about America, but it was worldwide, is Islam. Because Christianity had a tradition in America of black churches and white churches. And even in the white churches which allowed blacks, they would have to be in the back, somewhere off, you know, not sitting with the white people. This was their tradition, as in South Africa and elsewhere. So even in the religion, Christian religion had no basis in its teachings to deal with this sickness, this disease of racism. We also find from India, Gandhi himself saying, the Europeans in South Africa dread the advent of Islam as they Muslims claim equality with the white races. They may well dread it. If brotherhood is a sin, if it is equality of the colored races that they dread, then their dread is well founded because that's what Islam calls to. We also have one of the Indian freedom fighters, a female by the name of Sarojini Naidu. She said, I have been struck over and over again by this indivisible unity of Islam that makes a man instinctively a brother. When you meet an Egyptian, an Algerian, an Indian, and a Turk in London, what matters is that Egypt is the motherland of one and India is the motherland of another. That's all. They are one. So these are the observations of those who have looked at Islam from the outside as well as from within.